In December 218 BC, General Hannibal Barker fought the Romans and won an extraordinary victory at the Battle of Trebia. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in this video, which has been sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. More of them later. Now, um, it's difficult to know where exactly to start this story, but a quick summary of uh, events so far. Um, Hannibal has crossed the Pyrenees and is marched all the way across uh, southern Gaul, and Publius Cornelius Scipio, who was a consul who'd been given orders from Rome to go and fight him in Spain, found out about this when he made a stopover in Massilia, uh, which today is Marseille. He discovered that a massive army commanded by a Carthaginian general had crossed the Rhone and fought a battle against the local Gauls and was heading east, possibly for the Alps, but surely he wouldn't be crossing the Alps. I mean, it's getting snowy now, he wouldn't be doing that. Well, he did. Anyway, what did Scipio do? Well, he sent his brother to carry on with the mission uh, to Spain, while he himself, with a smaller force, went back to warn Rome, and he said, right, I'm the consul, so you hand your troops over to me, and you, and you, and he, he cobbled together a hotchpotch army and went north to, to investigate what was going on and to see about uh, heading off this Hannibal guy. Has he actually crossed the Alps? I mean, really, that's a bit weird, but maybe he has, and yes, he had, and he fought a battle at uh, the river Ticinus, and lost. Essentially, I won't go into a great amount of details, but it wasn't a huge and decisive battle, but it was a definite defeat for the Romans. And uh, the defeat was inflicted largely by the cavalry arm of the Carthaginians. The Carthaginians had a lot of cavalry, far more than was typical for a Roman army, and it was very good, experienced cavalry. And um, they did so well, in fact, that they overran the HQ squadron of uh, Scipio's army, and Scipio himself was severely wounded. And, uh, of course, that threw him onto the back foot. And Rome, discovering this, that sent orders to the other consul, Tiberius Sempronius Longus. Uh, but he was in Sicily, a long way to the south, at a place called Lilibaeum. And it took him 40 days to march... Well, to, first he had to sail to Italy, and then he had to march up Italy uh, through Rome, which I imagine was uh, not just convenient because uh, uh, good roads went to Rome, but also I think uh, it was an opportunity to give his troops maybe one day in Rome as a stopover rest to see their families and so forth, and then head out again. Uh, after a bit of resupply perhaps from the capital city uh, to, to deal with this threat in the north. And 40 days later he arrived. Now, there is some difficulty in working out exactly uh, what happened next because the history is not very clear about this. Did the two armies, uh, Scipio's army and Sempronius's, did these two combine into one grand army? Did the two generals actually meet and have a conversation? Um, at one point we are told that Hannibal is in between the two armies, perhaps deliberately keeping them apart because he didn't want them to combine into one super army. Um, but we are also given dialogues between Scipio and Sempronius suggesting that they were in the same room or tent together uh, arguing the situation. So is this the historian's way of telling us what the situation was, uh, I know, let's tell it in the form of a dialogue between two opposing points of view, or did these two men actually meet? And if they did actually meet, was there really someone writing down everything they said accurately? Um, that seems pretty unlikely, particularly given that in their dialogue they get straight to the point. No pleasantries, no did you have a, you know, a good journey, oh please, you know, have, um, warm your feet by the fire, none of that, just straight to the tactics. Um, Scipio and Sempronius were of two minds. Sempronius said, right, come on, let's fight. Let's, Adam, I've come all this way. My men haven't marched for 40 days to then just hang around. Let's, let's get stuck in. Come on, Scipio, let's do it. Um, but Scipio was saying, no, no, no wait. Right, okay, first, I want to command um, because you have been sent to assist me and I'm wounded, so let's give it a while for my wound to heal and then I'll be in command and that'll be better. Uh, plus, Meaning no offence, Sempronius, your men, particularly the Latin troops, they're really not very uh, well trained at all. They're, they're, they've got almost no battle experience. Maybe we should spend the winter, and winter is not a good time to be fighting, frankly. It's very cold and wet. Uh, let's train them through the winter. Uh, my wound will heal, and then we'll be in a much better position um, next season to take on Hannibal. Uh, plus, these Gauls who have just sided uh, with Hannibal, you know what Gauls are like, they're fickle. Give them a few months of hanging around in the cold and they'll all just want to go home. Yeah, if we just wait, that'll be good for us. Sempronius was thinking, no, well, I have none of this. I'm, you, you know, is, is this a, a Roman consul or his wound talking? Now, come on, um, the opportunity is now. We've got two combined armies together. We're never going to have more troops than this. Uh, are we going to uh, just spend the winter eating our supplies away? Uh, and, and what third army are we waiting for? No, no, it's us. It's, it's, 
it's, it's our armies, we're here to do the job, we should get stuck in, and my men are enthusiastic. Um, Hannibal, meanwhile, was probably wanting a fight for much the same load of reasons that Scipio didn't want a fight. He didn't want Scipio's wound to heal. He didn't want these troops to be trained up. Um, and he perhaps was worried that his allied Gauls were just going to defect or melt uh, back to their homes into the countryside. So he was quite happy for there to be a fight. Now, he did actually get a fight because some of the local Gauls uh, were hedging their bets somewhat. They didn't know which way the wind was blowing, they didn't know which side to support, and they knew that the consequences of supporting the wrong side uh, could be pretty dire. So they were sending out embassies to both sides, and Hannibal found out about this, he was very well informed, and sent out a punitive raid with his cavalry to, to nick a load of their stuff and punish them. Um, but that was when Sempronius's forces turned up, and Sempronius's forces surprised the laden cavalry of the Carthaginians. They were all carrying loads and loads of booty, and they couldn't move very fast, and they caught them and killed loads of them and pursued them right towards the Carthaginian camp. And then the Carthaginians in the camp said, well, we're not having this. And so they then spilled out of the camp, and then they, they put the Romans to flight, and then they chased them towards the Roman camp. And then Sempronius said, well, hey, this is great. We've got a big fight on our hands, guys. And he then brought out a load more Romans, and he then chased... Um, the Carthaginian counterattack back to the Carthaginian camp, at which point Hannibal said, Stop! Stop. Guys, I'm in command here. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. I haven't chosen this fight. This is not the ground I would choose to fight on. This is not the day I would choose to fight on. These are not the circumstances, not the time, not the place, and I'm in command. So he then did something quite remarkable. He then ordered all his troops, steadied them, and brought them back in good order, suffering almost no more casualties, back into camp, which is extremely impressive and difficult to do, but also showed that he was really not a hothead. And this is something about him. Whenever the Romans do catch him at a disadvantage, they're never able to capitalise on it. Hannibal, it seems, was always very, very good at recognising when this was not his day, and the best thing would be to just stop and pull back in good order before a genuine disaster occurs. Hannibal could not afford one significant defeat, but he could afford a minor defeat. Now, there was actually a use to this defeat, because it proved to Sempronius that Sempronius uh, was uh, the great guy. I mean, he'd just beaten the Carthaginians and he'd, he'd beaten their cavalry arm, their best guys. Oh, yeah, I mean, these cavalry, they defeated Scipio at the River Ticinus. But yeah, Scipio, that wounded guy. I am Sempronius and the gods are clearly with me because I've just won a victory as he saw it. So he was buoyed up with this idea that he can do this. He's got the men, he's got the morale, and this is an opportunity. So he was, it seems, a bit of a hothead. And this, we are told, was reported to Hannibal through Gallic uh, spies. So Hannibal then picked his day and picked his ground. And we are told that he did his own scouting and went out to ride on a horse and found just the right place for the battlefield. His camp was uphill and looking down onto a river and he found an area perfect for an ambush. Now, he was aware that the, the Romans were quite uh, uh, wary of woods nearby because Gauls like to hide in woods. You can be in a wood or behind a wood, you wouldn't see them. So if you see a wood, there's a, just a very convenient wood just there, just where you would want to spring an ambush from. So they would look at those woods and think you know, very suspiciously about them. But if they saw just some open rolling landscape, they'd think, okay, well, the, the land is clear, there's clearly no ambush there, everything's fine. Except, as a good infantry commander will tell you, a rolling landscape actually has loads of opportunities in it for hiding large numbers of troops. And Hannibal found uh, a little river valley which from uh, down by the river couldn't be seen. It just looked like just, just rolling land. But there was actually a little river valley in there, marshy, with some bushes, and you could hide a load of guys there for an ambush. But as you advanced across the plain, you would see nothing. So. That night, he said to Mago, his younger brother, who was one of his cavalry commanders, he said, pick out 100 of the best infantry and 100 of the best cavalry and tell them to meet me. I'm going to uh, make a speech to them. So Mago did this and Hannibal spoke to these 200 men. Um, I think one of the reasons that uh, he wanted to speak to 200 men is that there are actually, before the days of PA systems and so forth, there actually, there's quite a limit to the number of people you can actually speak to clearly uh, and expect to be heard. And he wanted these guys to hear him. And he said, right, all of you, you pick out uh, 
10, according to Polybius, or 9, according to Livy, men each. These will be your squad. You will pick them and they will be serving with you on special duty tonight. You're going to be part of the ambush which is going to win us this next battle. It's slightly odd that uh, we're told this detail. Um, perhaps the reason we're told this is that that's really not the way the Romans would have done it. You see, the Romans, um, each man, uh, it's, it's a privilege to serve in the army, and you have, uh, you take your oath to your commander to obey him, and the commander say, right, you, 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 and you, you're, you're going to be in the ambush, perhaps they would say. Whereas Hannibal had a volunteer mercenary army, and perhaps he had to treat his men quite differently accordingly. So if you are one of those hundred men, have been summoned to be personally addressed by Hannibal, you might be feeling pretty good about yourself. Hey, I'm one of the 100 best infantrymen in the whole army. This is an army of perhaps 40,000 men, but I'm in the top 100. <sighs> get a load of me. Oh, and I get to pick my own squad of my own friends or the guys I think are the best to get to serve with me. Okay, so you then pick those guys and those guys are going to think, hey, I've been picked for special duty. What is that duty? Well, it's to spend all night in a freezing marsh hiding. Um, that doesn't sound so great, does it? But if you've been picked out for special duty because you're so trusted, and by, by doing that special duty you've proven to all the rest of the army that you're one of the best guys in it, well, it's going to do wonders for your status and perhaps wonders for your self-esteem. And so perhaps that's the way you have to treat uh, volunteer mercenary armies rather than by authority. You, you're in the ambush. Don't argue. Go. So. He took his uh, 2,000 or 2,200, depending on uh, exactly how you do the counting, uh, men off and hid them all night in that marsh. Now, he had told the rest of his army, Hannibal told the rest of his army, we're going to be fighting tomorrow, so get well rested, and we're going to build really big fires because it's going to be a cold night, and you're going to be warming yourself by these, these, these fires, and we're, everyone's going to eat really well, we're going to put on extra rations, and... Uh, they, they doled out rations of um, olive oil with which the men rubbed themselves. This was supposedly to keep them warm and supple. I'm not entirely sure how that works, but apparently this is, this is what happened. So that was uh, the preparation made on the Carthaginian side. Now, he started the battle by sending out his Numidian cavalrymen. Now, Numidians were unusual cavalrymen uh, from North Africa. Uh, they didn't use bridles or saddles. They just had a, a thick rope, a thick sort of ribbon of rope around the horse's neck and they would hang on like that uh, in a way which uh, some people say uh, reminds them of uh, Native American Indians. Um, well anyway, they were very experienced troops. They'd been fighting under Hannibal in Spain for a very long time and these were not primitive barbarians. These guys could op operate in large numbers and follow orders, use their own initiative. They were excellent cavalry. He sent those out at night to attack Sempronius's camp. And this they did. And Sempronius thought, oh, we're under attack. Right. OK, wake everyone. Let's get to it. Here's the day of that battle I was hoping for. The thing is, though, that uh, he was playing right into Hannibal's hand. Now, the, uh, the Numidians then withdrew, but they'd been told to withdraw to the river and cross the river. And at this point, the Romans giving chase arrived at the river. So what happened next? Well, for a start, let me just state that I'm going to avoid the controversy of which side of the river we're talking about. Historians have long debated where the Roman camp was or whether two Roman camps, I think there probably were two Roman camps, one for Scipio, one for Sempronius, uh, but you know, was there one uh, Roman camp or two and where was Hannibal in relation to them and which side of the river was everyone and which direction did the Romans uh, cross the river and so I'm not going to get uh, embroiled in any of that because ultimately after talking for ages about it I'd have to say but we don't really know and it doesn't change the story of the battle all that much. Anyway, so there were some camps in some positions and uh, one army was one side of the river and the other army was the other, whichever side that was. Right. So it had rained heavily during the night and the river was quite swollen and came up to, all, all sources agree, chest height. Now, Sempronius ordered his men across the river. This was necessary, of course, to get to grips with the Carthaginians who were retreating across the river, and his uh, last battle involved chasing the, the Carthaginians across a river, and so you know, perhaps he was in the habit of chasing Carthaginians across the river. But this time it was different because Hannibal was ready for him, had deployed his army. Now what 
did the Romans see when they looked across the river? Of course, we don't know. We have to speculate at this point. And one of the things we have to ask ourselves is, did the Carthaginians have any pikes? Yeah, uh, you see, in Greek, there are vague terms used for a long pointy stick that you use in war, and sometimes the same word can be translated quite accurately as javelin or spear or lance or pike. And uh, in my, for instance, copy of Polybius, there are a lot of uh, there are 8,000 Balearic slingers and pikemen who are used as a screening force on the Carthaginian uh, side. Pikemen? Well, they may have been pikemen at Trebia. We have good reason to believe that the Carthaginians used to fight with lots of pikemen, but there's pretty much no evidence that after this battle they ever used pikes, at least not in the Second Punic War when fighting in Italy against the Romans. But possibly Trebia was the last battle in which pikes were used, or pikes at least and here I really am speculating, presented to the enemy, because it strikes me that you might, if you're in Hannibal's position, actually want the Romans to look across the river and see pikes, because our thing about pikes is they can't move very fast. Um, yes, one man could run, I suppose, reasonably fast with a pike, although they're big, awkward things. A pike is maybe 18 feet long, something like that. Um, but big formations uh, of pikes cannot move very fast. They just go at a, a fast walk if they're good because um, they have to stay together and stay in formation and getting the orders to travel down a very large formation of, of many thousands of men. It's, it's slow. They're slow and ponderous troops. But if you're looking across the river and you think, right, can we cross the river before those troops get us? Answer, yes, because they're a load of pikes. Um, and do the Carthaginians want us to cross the river? Well, no, because that's why they're pelting us with slings. The Balearic slingers were mercenary troops from the Balearic Isles in the, the Mediterranean, and uh, they were famous for being really good slingers. Um, these were people who had learned how to sling as little shepherd boys right from, from the early youth. They'd been using slings their whole life uh, to hunt pests and to protect their flocks. And even to herd sheep, you can sling in front of a sheep that's starting to stray to whoop, get it to go back and join the flock. So these were very good slingers. They started young and they hired themselves out for good rates because they were, they were valued troops. So it looked as though they, don't, they didn't want us to get across the, uh, the, the river, but maybe if we go quickly now, we can get across the river. But if you go in a column across the river, it's going to take you absolutely ages. And if there are pikes the other side, the pikes could just attack the head of that column and mash it. But if the pikes are set back from the river and we cross the river in a line, so we all form up an army one side of the river and we all cross together, we'll be across the river pretty quickly. The pikes won't be able to um, uh, stop us and neither will those Balearic slingers because yes, they'll cause some casualties, but we'll be able to get across and then get stuck in straight away. So perhaps um, the Carthaginians did have pikes, though I'm perfectly willing to accept that maybe they didn't. For instance, uh, in one historical source, uh, the pikes are described as racing ahead uh, with the Numidians in order to attack the flanks of the enemy, which makes them sound more like javelin-armed light infantry, which also fits that they were 8,000 of them sent forward with the Balearic slingers. Yes, you might also mix in a load of javelin-armed infantry, perhaps with shields as well. So maybe they had pikes, maybe they didn't. Anyway, it seems that the Romans did cross the river, which was a huge mistake. Now, of course, they had to cross the river in order to get to grips with the enemy, but it was December and it was icy and all the sources talk about gusts of snow. And if you're wading across a river up to your chest, and of course some men are bound to stumble and go in over their heads, uh, you are going to get very cold and you climb out the other side and then you're going to be standing around for a while. You're not going to get stuck in straight away. Battles of this size took, size took hours to get thousands and thousands of men all together in position and then to get the orders all the way down the line and get them uh, to, to do whatever it is you want them to do. It takes ages. So inevitably, a lot of those men were standing around and the wind was getting up and it started to rain and sleet and they were soaking wet and they hadn't had breakfast either because if you remember they, they were attacked uh, very early in the morning actually before dawn and uh, no breakfast had, uh, had been issued because Samperinus were, oh, we're under attack we have to respond breakfast God, that's for sissies come on get out there so these men had not eaten and they hadn't been warmed by fires and they'd been drenched in a freezing cold river with ice on its banks and now they had to fight their way uphill against the Carthaginians so things at this point didn't look too good. Um, now the first uh, clash, uh, first clashes happened with the cavalry 
And it's, it's said that the Numidians, who had been feigning this retreat, suddenly whirled about and uh, fell upon their pursuers with such ferocity that pursuers went, oh, oh, heck, uh, this isn't good, and they then fell back. The Roman cavalry was heavily outnumbered. The Romans had 2,000 cavalry on each flank, uh, whereas Hannibal's army had 5,000 cavalry and better cavalry on both flanks. Uh, so when they suddenly whirled about and charged in, uh, the Roman cavalry really didn't stand much of a chance. Nor did the Willites. Now, the Willites are the lightest of the Roman troops. Uh, the youngest of them would have been 17 years old, and the oldest not many years older than that. Um, and these men had been fighting with the Numidians for some while and expended a lot of their javelins, so they only had one or two javelins left each, and they were very cold and they were inexperienced. And they then were attacked by an outnumbering horde of Hannibal's light infantry. And these were, a lot of them were uh, Celtiberians and Spanish troops who had been fighting for campaign after campaign after campaign in Spain, and they really knew what they were doing. They wouldn't have been a huge amount older, they would have been perhaps 25 years older, but when you're 17, and you're with a load of 17 year olds, and you see that the other guys you're up against are 25, they're not just bigger and stronger, but they're more confident, and um, they're not soaking wet and they really know what they're doing, and you've never done this before, and the Welites got absolutely mashed. They were hopelessly outclassed. Um, but that didn't matter too much at this stage, because it was generally imagined that once you've got an army into position, you're going to pull back your screen of light troops anyway. They're not expected to win the battle. So the fact that the Welites got horribly mashed uh, didn't matter that much, and Sempronius pulled them back to the rear of his line, and then was ready to get stuck in with his heavy troops. Now, uh, a lot of you, that, because you're watching this, I imagine, are quite interested in the, 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 the gentle art of hitting people. And if so, then you might be interested that the Great Courses Plus has now got a, a course in martial arts. Yes, martial arts. It's a 25 lecture course of 25 half hours, and it covers um, uh, all sorts of basic principles, and uh, the class is taken from uh, Krav Maga and Karate and uh, Taekwondo and uh, uh, Jeet Kune Do and uh, I think there's Thai boxing there and uh, Tai Chi and various other martial arts and they've all been commissioned specially. These are not just uh, cobbled together, oh we found 25 videos, no these have been shot specially in all in the same studio. They've brought in experts in these various martial arts uh, and have told them to prepare a half hour lecture in something specific. And uh, if there only there was somewhere you could see this, for there is! What you could do is you could click the link in the description or if you love typing, uh, you could go to www.thegreatcoursesplus.com stroke Lindy Beige, and you could find there a landing page for a free one month trial offer. And good news, a lot of people have written to me complaining that uh, they found it very difficult to pay with the credit card or debit card that they were using, particularly people in Britain or Europe. Uh, and I can now say that it has been optimised uh, for Australia and the UK. So if you're in the Australia and the UK and you've tried before and weren't able to pay and got a little bit frustrated, um, you should now be able to pay. Um, but you don't have to for the first month, of course. That's free and you can watch in that first month as many of the 9,000 lectures that are there uh, as you like for free. Uh, so click the link in the description and uh, unfortunately I, I can't do any gags here about scholars cradles because would you believe it, I didn't see a single scholars cradle, well that's martial arts people for you isn't it? Right now back to the battle of the Trebia or Trebia or Trebia uh, which is the name of the river which has been crossed and has soaked uh, the Roman army so they're all dripping wet and freezing cold and miserable but a lot of them are still pretty good troops and they are marching with their commander, Tiberius Sempronius Longus, uphill against the, uh, the, the uh, forces of Hannibal Barca arrayed against him. Um, the Romans had a very conventional formation, cavalry on the wings, light troops that start in the front and then pull to the back, and then three lines with your Hastati, Principes and Triarii moving up in the usual way. They had lots of allies with them, including uh, quite a lot of Gauls, actually. There was just one tribe, the Kenomani, who had stayed loyal to them, and they were, they were fighting on the Roman side. Uh, opposite them, uh, Hannibal had put possibly some pikes, but maybe not, uh, his own light troops, which also were pulled back uh, after the initial uh, encounter. 
And then he had heavy troops in the front, including his a very experienced uh, African spearman. Um, when, you say, when I say African, by the way, that's troops from Africa, but these are Phoenicians and Libyans. These are not sub-Saharan Africans. So uh, people from the USA, when they hear African, they often think of, oh, African-Americans. So they think of dark-skinned, sub-Saharan, uh, woolly-haired uh, troops. No, they weren't like that. They were. They looked far more, uh, well, in the case of the Phoenicians, the Phoenicians were actually from the Eastern Mediterranean, so they just sort of looked generally Mediterranean-y. Um, perhaps think of today um, people from Lebanon, Palestine, and places like that. And uh, the North African natives, such as the uh, Numidians, they were like the uh, Berbers or Tuaregs of today, a sort of Arabic-y look. Anyway, um, uh, so we had those uh, in the centre, and the Gauls as well arrayed in, in the centre, and some versions, uh, Polybius has the elephants in front of the flanks of the, uh, the heavy infantry, uh, which I find reasonably likely, but according to uh, Livy, they were beyond the cavalry, outside of the cavalry, so he had heavy infantry, cavalry, elephants, according to uh, Livy, um, but I, I, I'm more, I, I feel that Polybius is probably right. Polybius was writing much closer to the events, and he's usually taken to be more accurate by historians, though it is notable that there are an awful lot of things that Livy says uh, that just simply do not appear in Polybius, and uh, how much should we trust them? Anyway, um, the elephants do get stuck in. Uh, in uh, Polybius's account, they don't seem to do a huge amount. They see off a lot of the, uh, the cavalry uh, um, and then uh, don't seem to play a huge amount of, uh, of a role in the battle after that. But in, in, with Livy, he has them doing all sorts of things. He has them seeing off the enemy cavalry, then attacking the infantry, and then being seen off by the light infantry, which are brought forward to see them, uh, to see them off. Uh, light infantry are actually more effective against elephants than heavy infantry. That may seem a little counterintuitive, but if you're a light infantryman, you can get out of the way because you're in a dispersed formation. You can get round behind and, and jab your, your javelins and so forth into, into vulnerable spots like uh, just beneath the tail, uh, the, uh, up, up, the, up the jacksy of the, of the elephant and so forth. Um, whereas heavy troops uh, sometimes just get smashed and trampled by, uh, by elephants. And because an elephant charging you, that means that everyone in the formation doesn't want to be the guy who's right at the front who just gets trampled on literally. So you've got a, a heavy formation of guys who are all trying to get out of the way and they all get in each other's way and so doing. So yes, light troops are actually more effective than heavy troops against elephants. But anyway, uh, it seems that the Romans were able to see them off and it came to the point that, according to Livy, uh, Hannibal saw that uh, the elephants might actually panic and start trampling his own side, uh, and so he withdrew them and uh, sent them in again against the, the Gauls, uh, which is not impossible, but it shows an impressive amount of command and control over such notoriously difficult to command and control uh, units such as elephants. Anyway, the elephants did whatever the elephants did, and the two lines did meet, and for a long time uh, the two lines just clashed, and uh, it wasn't obvious who was winning. But then Mago, you remember Mago who was waiting in ambush, was able to launch his ambush and get his 2,000 or 2,200 men round the back. Now 2,200 may not sound that many if you're up against a Roman army of perhaps 37,000, uh, but you got to remember that the land isn't all flat. It's not like in the movies where you can see absolutely everything because they've picked a convenient bit of land for that. Uh, the land rolls a bit, and if you see 2,000 guys, are those the nearest 2,000 guys of a body of men that's 10,000 big? And if you see the front row of uh, a unit, do you know how deep that formation is? So when you see what is a large number of troops appear behind you, they, those troops are enormously more effective than just their own numbers would imply. So 2,000 men behind the Roman lines are worth like 6,000 men or, or the like. And Mago was commanding his cavalry, who then cut down the poor Willites, who at this point were trying to shelter at the back of the army. The wrong place to pick, as it turned out, because a load of Carthaginian cavalry then came and mowed them down. Um, and Sempronius saw that everything was going wrong. His flanks panicked and collapsed, and men started fleeing in all directions. Some tried to get back to the river behind them, uh, but of course uh, it's pouring with rain. I should have said it's pouring with rain at this point, so you can't see very far, and the river is now really swollen and even more dangerous and difficult to get across. Um, but Sempronius manages to cut his way through the Carthaginian line with 10,000 men formed in a square. Now, uh, it, it seems that they did inflict not insignificant losses against the Carthaginians doing this, um, 
but when they got to the top of the hill they were able to look down and see the flanks have gone, all the troops at the back are being annihilated, our allies are all running away, the cavalry's gone, the cavalry just fled. It seems that most of the cavalry got away. It's actually very difficult, even if you're on a horse and a good cavalryman, to catch and kill an enemy cavalryman if he just doesn't want to be caught. If he's not fighting you, if he's just trying to escape, he usually can. So the, most of the Roman cavalry flees and Sempronius, with his men at the top of the hill, just think, well, we're not going to rescue this situation. So he marches in, in good order to the nearby uh, Roman colony that was quite young of Placentia. Uh, and we're told that Scipio marched with his army uh, to Cremona, having gone to Placentia, Pla or Placentia first, but went on to Cremona so as not to burden the town, one town, with two armies wintering in it. Um, which very strongly suggests that there was a significant number of men with Scipio. So did Scipio lend any of his army to Sempronius? Almost certainly yes. We're told that the Romans had 37,000 men, so it seems that Scipio must have lent some men for that. Um, my best guess is that he gave them, he gave Sempronius his Latin allies, about two legions worth, whilst kept uh, keeping two legions for himself. Um, that fits everything that I've read in all the sources, so that's, that's what I would say, but I'm sure there are people out there who would disagree with me. Uh, so, Hannibal managed to lure an entire Roman army across a river to get it soaking wet and then ambush it and then hit it with elephants and with his very keen Gallic allies and, and smash it up. Yes, 10,000 of the Romans got away, but from an army of 37,000, that's not brilliantly impressive. Rome, when it heard the news, well, was first actually a little bit confused because Sempronius was trying to save face. Now, one of the reasons, which I forgot to mention earlier, that Sempronius wanted to fight this uh, fight in the first place is that there were elections coming up. If they waited for the spring, he would be replaced because during the before the, the, the new campaigning season started, back in Rome, they would elect two new consuls and he would just be a proconsul, just a placeholder for the new commander uh, to, to take over from. And he wanted to be the guy who defeated Hannibal and saved Rome, right? And his faction, even though he himself wasn't up for election, his faction was up for election. And uh, he would have done his, his faction a tremendous uh, amount of good if he had, was fresh back from a victory. Um, so by going for personal glory, he had fallen into Hannibal's trap, had crossed the river when he shouldn't have crossed the river, got suckered uh, into chasing a load of uh, cavalry who completely outclassed him once they knew what they were doing. Um, he got all his light troops annihilated, his cavalry ran away, he got hit by elephants, it all went horribly wrong, and something like 28,000 Romans were killed, or at least lost. Um, so this was a very significant victory for Hannibal, and it was the first really big victory uh, for Hannibal in Italy. Uh, but unfortunately, um, uh, still at this point, no, none of the, none of the uh, Latin states that was allied to, um, to, to Rome at this point, the vassal states, none of them came over to his side. But there was at least a little, there was a, there was a little bit of uh, uh, help. The, the town of Clastidium, uh, sent uh, word to him that uh, they had loads of stores and he could he could use the grain, the Roman grain, in those stores. And they were let in by the commander uh, who was called Brundisius. And it's thought that he was from Brundisium, which is modern Brindisi, and that he was actually one of those uh, Latin vassal uh, citizens and that possibly uh, you know, that was a sign that maybe he could persuade these people who were subjugated by the Romans to swap sides and that he could cast himself as the liberator of, of Latin Italy against the, the domination of Rome. Um, but the evidence for, for all that is, is quite slight. In some versions, uh, he just bribes the guy with a very large am amount of money and that's how he gets in. But in other versions, uh, he's let in and then later rewards him, which is you know, a little, little bit different in feel. Anyway, Sempronius sent word to the Senate um, of what had happened. And he said that a battle had been fought, but that uh, it had been interrupted by bad weather and that he was unable to, to uh, make it a decisive victory. So uh, that was rather ambiguous. But later on... The Romans found out that that was just rubbish. They found out that both their senators, uh, both their uh, consuls, had fled and were wintering in fortified cities, and that the um, that they'd lost a huge number of men, and that the field was uh, commanded by Hannibal, and that the Gauls were going over in some numbers to Hannibal's cause. So, yeah, uh, his his uh, attempt at uh, 
painting uh, the, this loss in a good light really didn't last very long. Um, what would have happened if he had waited? Well, one of the things, possibly, is that the uh, cold would have killed a lot of those elephants. We are told that all but one of Hannibal's elephants just died of cold uh, shortly after that battle. So perhaps if they'd just waited a bit, um, that would have happened. And perhaps the, uh, perhaps the uh, um, Gauls would have defected, and perhaps Hannibal would have been in a terrible supply situation. Um, he was already, it seems, getting short on grain. It's winter. He's got a huge army to feed. How is he going to do it? He has to win victories and steal stuff off the enemy and, and impress the locals so that they start donating food to his cause. Um, so Hannibal um, was in more of a hurry than the Romans to fight this battle. Um, but whoops, thanks to the hothead Sempronius, he scored something of a victory.